So some of the written records do talk about women fighting. They are heartless. We do know of other cases of women from that period uh, in positions of power who would be in charge of forces and in charge of other people. So that's definitely quite a likely interpretation, I think. Godless barbarians. And the Valkyries are these creatures that essentially swoop down onto the battlefield, pick the slain warriors and take them to Valhalla, to Odin. Hi there, and welcome to Hair Lesson, the podcast where we ask smart people stupid questions inspired by video games. I am your host, Brendan Caldwell, and today we are talking about Assassin's Creed Valhalla, an action game where you play a Viking pillaging the coastal towns of England and slurping up druggy water that lets you visit the mythical realm of Asgard. But as we do every episode, we want to ask a deeper question about the game's theme. This time we want to know who were the Vikings, specifically who were the Viking shield maidens? Uh, keep listening to hear from a top tier bioarchaeologist who will help us answer that question. But also here to help us out is Alice Bale, deputy editor of PC Games website Rock Paper Shotgun. Hi! Hello, Brendan. How are you? I'm good. How are you? How are you enjoying the druggy water? It's delicious. Thank you for asking. I like that that's your, that's the key element for you that's the main bit yeah i was watching a lot of the trailers and stuff and that's what i took away yeah well why not you've been playing a good bit of this game yeah and i know you're a fan of the series uh it's a, it comes from like a long line of historical murder simulators can you tell anyone unfamiliar with the mm. assassins or maybe who hasn't played an assassin's creed game in a while what is assassin's creed valhalla all about Assassin's Creed is a series of action adventure games where you play interesting assassins throughout history. Sometimes, you know, it'll turn out that you had a pivotal role in the American Revolution, sometimes the French Revolution. Not all revolution based, but often, it seems. And in Assassin's Creed Valhalla, you are a viking raider or well raider slash settler combined i suppose you're part of the the i think the heathen army i think they were called of like norse uh invaders that uh came and tried to settle in the the uk in the 800s i think like 870 something maybe and yeah the drinking drug juices incidental well <laughs> but like so what what else do you do in it you just wander around like what does it look like is it is it a third person walk around you thing so it's third person so over the shoulder and you play uh eivor a big buff uh viking who you can be either male or female and actually there is a a law kind of explanation for it that's kind of quite important i suppose uh there is like a framing narrative for assassin's creed that people i think most people stopped caring about but um <laughs> but that's still there if you pay any attention to it uh yeah so you are set basically you're trying to forge a new life for yourself uh, and uh some of your t tribe is the wrong word um but your group your family of vikings uh having left norway and uh, you're settling in uh the midlands basically and it's half wandering about the countryside in sort of autumn-ish. And then uh, a lot of stabbing people and raiding monasteries, burning down churches. So it is kind of uh, a mix of being a peaceful settler and doing trading with the local Saxons and stuff and being like, hey, I'm cool. And then 50% burning down churches and stealing stuff. <laughs> so uh, He said you can play as like man eivor or or woman eivor is mm. it eivor or ivor uh eivor which is disappointing to me because i wanted to be able to call the male version guyvor <laughs> if it was pronounced ivor but it's pronounced eivor hevor and shevor yeah <laughs> there you go but wh which one did you choose shevor shevor Sh shevor well, yeah because this is important because a lot of media about the vikings has happily taken up the idea that women in the viking era uh, were on the battlefield. Mm. Uh, they were shield maidens, or they were fellow warriors, and stuff like that. Mm. Like if you watch the TV show Vikings and things. And to find out more about this, uh, I have spoken to a bioarchaeologist, Dr. Kat Jarman, 
Uh, she's also the author of a book called River Kings, which isn't out yet, but it's going to be. And she's the advisor for a, a new museum on the Viking Age in Oslo. Uh, so here's what she had to tell us about shield maidens and the Vikings in general. This is a time of conquest. The age of Vikings. First of all, can you please introduce yourself to our listeners? Who are you and what do you do for a living? Hi, yeah, my name is Kat Jarman and I am an archaeologist and a bioarchaeologist. Bioarchaeologist. What is the difference between that and an archaeologist without the bio? <laughs> so archaeologists work on all sorts of materials, um, objects basically. So the difference between us and, and historians is that we don't mainly work with text, we work with things that are typically in the ground. A bioarchaeologist works specifically with human remains, so a lot of my work is based on working with ancient skeletons. So it's a bit like being a forensic investigator, but for crime scenes that happened a thousand years ago. Yeah, very, very cold crimes, basically. <laughs> so we try and work out as much as possible about people from, from their bodies, basically, rather than just their things. Hey, the wolf kissed us no more. That name is dead to this world. So you look at things like bones or teeth, for example. Yep. That's right. So we look at graves, so skeletons, and we look at kind of physical evidence, and it can be anything from uh, just stuff like how tall you are, and if you're a man or a woman, if you were injured or killed, or if you had diseases. And then what I specialize in is actually looking at some really detailed chemical analysis of teeth and bone that tell us stuff like what sort of food you ate, where you grew up, uh, even looking at genetics as well. So can you tell what the person looked like in the video game? Assassin's Creed Valhalla, your characters have tattoos all over them and they have very stylish asymmetrical hairstyles and stuff like that. Is that something you can find out from Romanians or is that something you find out somewhere else? Yeah, unfortunately, we haven't got much evidence like that because skin and hair doesn't really preserve very well in the in the ground. We can sometimes get that sort of thing if uh, in extreme environments. So if you have a frozen body, for example, there was a, as a really old skeleton uh, in the Alps, in the Italian Alps, that actually did have tattoos preserved. But in the Viking Age, we don't find that. So we don't really know uh, very much about hair. We don't know about tattoos from those sources themselves. We do get some information from written sources. So there is one source uh, that actually relates to likely Scandinavians uh, found in, in Russia who uh, are described as having tattoos covering their bodies. So there is some, but apart from that, we know very little. So it's a lot of it is guesswork, unfortunately. And at the tattooist, you'll customize Eivor's look. When you do work on teeth and bones and stuff, how does that process itself actually work? Yeah, so we start with the skeleton itself and we have to take samples from it. So that's a, quite an invasive process and we try and take as little as possible because these are these are real people from the past. And you then take that to the lab and then you try and extract whatever it is that, that you want from it. And when we work with bone, that's usually something called collagen, which is what a lot of you, uh, your skin and your hair and your nails and your bones uh, is made up of. Uh, inside that collagen, there's there's a lot of chemical information that we can analyze. So there's a bit of lab work. You take the samples, you you sort of chuck in lots of chemicals. Um, it's very much like cooking. You just follow a recipe and then you sort of add in whatever you, you need, really. And then eventually you stick that into a machine like a mass spectrometer or something like that, which, which then you take what's usually a liquid and uh, it analyzes it for whatever uh, evidence you're looking for. And then you get typically just numbers in a spreadsheet and then you have to try and interpret those numbers so it's uh it's quite tedious you have to be very patient and then after that you've got to do all the analysis basically our task will not be an easy one in the game you come to england as a raider in the year 873 ad as an invader is that what most Vikings would have been in this time period? I think an awful lot of, of the Vikings that, that go out of Scandinavia at time, that time will be raiders. And they're definitely the ones that we hear about the most. But we know that some also did come as settlers. So some came quite peacefully. Uh, but we don't necessarily know how many. We don't know where. But, uh, but it's mainly the raids that we hear about. So... A lot of Vikings were traders as well. Uh, we have evidence from that with things like trading weights at scales, very much like scales we use today, that date to the 9th century that show us that, that some of them were a little bit more peaceful. When you say scales, you mean that 
they would have carried these scales with them on their trading voyages to weigh one good against another. Yeah, exactly. And they're, they're quite small, so they're little handheld things. And they're, they're just two sort of, two little bowls that hang and suspend up. Um, and we find them, some I'll find loose in the ground and others are found in graves. So some people are buried with them. And um, they normally are used for quite small quantities. We also find weights, which are the ones that correspond to certain values. So we know that they would be weighing out things like maybe silver, uh, maybe other precious metals, and then trading them for whatever else that, that has been lost in the archaeological record. You will be worth your weight in silver. Ha. Uh, to the ship. In the video game, you're not specifically a traitor. You're a bit more violent than that. It lets you play as a Viking woman or a man, and either way, the character is basically the same. They're a seasoned fighter, a very strong warrior. In archaeology circles, there have been articles discussing the likelihood of women on the battlefield in that era. Uh, and in popular culture, we hear them called shield maidens. But I want to know from you, did shield maidens exist? Or were they commonplace? Or what, what, what's the deal? So that's uh, the million dollar question, I think. And I wish I could answer it uh, properly. So we don't quite know still, which is why there's so much a, a debate around it. But actually, there's been some quite exciting new evidence recently and a lot of it from bioarchaeology. So some of the written records do talk about women fighting. The problem is that most of those sources are much later. So they date to the 12th or the 13th century. So actually after the Viking Age. They also aren't necessarily completely reliable accounts. Some of them are from the mythology, so that the religious beliefs. So there's things like the Valkyries and the goddess Freya who goes into battle. She's the, she's the, the goddess of a warfare. And the Valkyries are these uh, creatures that essentially swoop down onto the battlefield and pick the slain warriors and take them up uh, to Valhalla to, to go to, to Odin. Whether they actually represent real people, we don't really know. Some of the saga literature, which is um, Icelandic, right? So it, they are stories written down mainly in Iceland in the 12th or 13th century, talk about women fighting as well. But again, we, if you're talking about 873, that's nearly you know, 400, 300, 400 years afterwards. So we, we don't know if that's real. Now go, Eivor. Claim your place in Valhalla. The other thing that we have, and that's now quite exciting, is every now and then we do get some graves with weapons in. And very recently, there was one very famous case from a site called Birka in Sweden that everyone thought was uh, a man. It was uh, somebody buried with lots of weapons, with two horses, always put down as a sort of ultimate warrior. And then a new ancient DNA analysis actually showed that this was a uh, genetically female body, and not male after all. That site, that grave site in Burko, when when was that found? So it was actually dug up, I can't remember now if it was the 18th or 19th century, 19th century, I think. But at the time, they couldn't tell just from the skeleton itself if it was a man or a woman. So it was really just a new DNA that, that gave this whole new angle. So someone like you, a bioarchaeologist, came along, cooked up a bone dish, did the mass spectrometer <laughs> in the lab and figured out actually this these people 100 years ago or whatever were, were wrong. Essentially, yes. Yeah. So this was through DNA analysis, uh, this one. But yeah, it was taking a sample of, of, the, of the bone and getting some numbers coming out on a computer screen. We do quite a lot of that. Another thing that I've been working on is looking, again, on bones and teeth and looking at mobility because we actually... We have traces of where we, where we grow up and where we live in our bones and teeth, which I think is a really um, bizarre but very exciting uh, thing. And so we can look at where in the world we might have grown up, what sort of climate, what sort of environment. And looking at that, we used to think that all the women in the Viking Age uh, more or less stayed at home. And it was the men who went out raiding or moving or, you know, whatever they were doing. And now we're actually seeing that a lot of those women were also moving out of Scandinavia. They weren't just staying at home on the farm. They were part of, of that outwards, either if they were raiding or migrating. We don't really know, but, but they were definitely out there. Eivor, Sigurd, I give you England and its four kingdoms. Mercia, East Anglia, Northumbria and Wessex. What other kind of things would you find in a Viking grave? Like not just weapons. What, what other things would, would they be buried with? The Viking graves vary enormously. 
there are people who are buried with absolutely nothing and uh, we don't quite know why. Some of it might to do with status. So if you're not very wealthy, you haven't really got things um, to, to put in the grave with you. And other times it's about belief. So for example, when people converted to Christianity, there wasn't this belief that you had to have things with you to the afterlife because in, in Christianity, you're not meant to do that. So some of it to do with religion. But um, other times, we don't know, maybe just preference. So some people just have one or two things, maybe a sword, maybe a knife. Some things definitely relate to what that person did, or at least that's that's what we think. We don't quite know. Uh, so it could be somebody who's a trader, could have a balance and some of those weights that we were talking about earlier. Or somebody who does a lot of textile work could have textile equipment, like a spindle whirl, which you use for, for making um, yarn or wool. Ah. Oh. Your father, Sax. The weapon of a coward. A scorn snake. Some of the most wealthy ones are absolutely spectacular. You have full ship burials. So you have people buried in an entire big Viking ship with uh, animals. Quite a lot of Vikings are buried with animals. That really? Are, yeah, yeah. So it can be anything from dogs to to um, horses and cows. Usually they are thought to be uh, sort of sacrifices that are then needed for the afterlife. So it's not a case of them killing their pet dog and saying, you're coming with me. In some cases, I think that is the case. There was one, um, definitely several uh, graves where, where there is just a dog. Uh, there's one big ship grave uh, actually in Estonia where several dogs are buried alongside the warriors um, and things like weapons as well. But they've looked at the um, teeth and bone of those dogs and it's shown that they were came from the same place that the humans came from so they had taken them on a raid with them these dogs and then they had been been killed to follow their owners so that they could be together in the afterlife in assassin's creed you also get a wolf as a pet but this wolf is is pretty big you can ride this wolf around as if it's a horse, basically. Okay. You haven't found any giant wolf bones by any chance? Not yet, no. I would love to find a giant wolf, but so far, from my knowledge, no giant wolves. I read that in the, the Burka burial site, there was also a game board buried with, with a woman there. What could that signify or what could that mean? Yeah, games are actually quite common in graves. There's quite a lot of them that have either a whole set or just some pieces. Um, they're usually thought to be from a game called Neffeltafel, which is a bit like checkers or, or sort of a very uh, simple version of chess. And uh, you, so you get the board and you get these pieces. Sometimes they're of glass, sometimes they're of bone and really beautifully carved. And we think that they are very, very popular games to play socially, but some also think that they might have something to do with strategy. So you know how playing chess is a lot about strategy and tactics. That's sometimes associated with, with military functions. So it's thought that these, these kind of military leaders are using these games as a way of kind of maybe practicing or negotiating strategy. If that's true, I don't know, but it's, it's quite an interesting uh, theory anyway. Yeah, because it means that whoever this woman is, she might have not just been a warrior on the field, but if she was buried with such in such splendor, she might have been in charge of other warriors. Exactly, and I think that's part of the key. Uh, some people have, have said, well, she doesn't actually have any discernible injuries on her body, and she doesn't. We can't sort of prove that she was very strong or that she definitely wielded weapons. But if you were in a, a sort of high power military. Uh, position then you weren't necessarily the one on the battlefield wielding an axe all the time you could be at the back and actually commanding the troops and we do know of other cases of women from that period with uh, in positions of power who would be in charge of forces and in charge of other people so that's definitely quite a likely interpretation i think and so i race my horn to the raven clan the best of friends and fighters uh, so you look at human remains and you look at other objects as well. Uh, I think one of the things you talk about in a, in a recent book you've written is a bead from a necklace or something. How can a single bead help us to learn what the Viking world was like? Yeah, that's right. So this is uh, the book uh, River Kings, which is uh, I've just finished writing and it's coming out in, in February next year, which follows a bead of a material called carnelian, which is a semi-precious stone that was found in this 
mass burial of uh, likely Viking warriors in Repton in Derbyshire in England. And the bead itself comes most likely from India. So my question in that book was basically, how on earth do you get this bead from India to Repton in the ninth century? And what can that tell us? Why do the Vikings interact with the Silk Roads, for example, all these networks in, in Eastern Europe? And then when you do that, you start to find these amazing stories of, of individual people who've traveled, things like the accounts of uh, tattooed individuals in, in Russia, for example. And then you find the same sort of evidence, you find the same scales and weights, you find all these objects in England and in Scandinavia, in Russia, in Turkey, and, uh, you know, all these different places. So people have moved and that's that's kind of what the bead is, is telling us, I guess. Ramzi. Your husband returns, bringing gifts and riches to share. You've called the book River Kings. I, I think a lot of people always think of Vikings as sailors of the sea. You know, they go over the oceans. But why are they considered the rulers of rivers? Yeah, so this is what exactly what I wanted to look at because that's how they're typically presented. And it's, it's these big journeys across the North Sea or up to Iceland and Greenland or even North America that people tend to think about. But actually, an awful lot of the Viking expansion happened on the rivers. And one of the, the, the really sort of exciting things is that these ships, these boats, could do both. So you could actually take a boat across the North Sea and then you could go up the rivers of England. So a lot of the raids, if you look at the raids and the attacks, they are very much along rivers. So Repton, for example, that's on the River Trent. And you can get there from the North Sea. It's really the rivers that are the absolute key to understanding these movements. So... I have called them River Kings because I think that that's, that's essentially the slightly unknown part of the Viking world that we tend to forget about. It makes you wonder if the Vikings could have created canals, they probably would have loved it. Yeah, absolutely. There are some places where it's suggested that they, they did make canals and they did sort of make some of the, maybe starting with a natural riverway and then making it a bit bigger, making it even easier to, to move across. Um, other places they actually went overland, so the boats were taken out of the water and then pulled across land for really quite a long way and then stuck into another river on the other side again. So, you know, if you, if you couldn't get through it on your boat, you just had to take it overland instead. Kat Jarman, that's all the questions I have. Uh, thank you for talking to us about this topic. No, my pleasure. Thanks for asking me. A journey beyond kingdoms and into the soul of a warrior. That was Dr. Kat Jarman, bioarchaeologist. If you want to hear more from her, you can listen to the full unabridged interview by becoming a supporter of the show for $2 a month. Uh, for $2, you get a longer version of the interviews we do with all of our experts. Just go to patreon.com slash heylesson or click the show more button in the show notes to find a link to that. This week's uh, interview with her is a bit shorter than normal. It's only 25 minutes or so. Others are much longer. And your your two bucks a month gets all of the previous full-length interviews. So that's good. And as well as that, you're just helping us out. It's really good as well. This, she's like Bones from the TV show Bones, but real. She is. She's like Bones, but for the, for the distant past. Yeah. Alice. Yes. Our friend Eivor, the protagonist of Valhalla. What do you reckon she wants to be buried with when she's buried well uh i think definitely the bones of uh whichever mighty steed uh you pick to i i have the wolf steed the rideable wolf the rideable wolf which is is actually quite annoying because uh if you get off it um and it stays in the vicinity it then howls <laughs> fretfully uh which is quite annoying uh so that and then bones of best raven friend satellite drone raven because you you have one of those what like a little bird that tells you whether land is nearby or what so uh a feature of the recent assassin's creed games is that you have uh you had a best friend eagle that would <laughs> fly in the sky uh and then you could look through its eyes with the power of I don't know, being really good friends with it. And that then you could then scout the land out and like spot enemies and things. But for this Assassin's Creed, obviously it is a, a raven because that's more thematically appropriate. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the bones of, of your raven. So that, and then probably her, her weapons as well, I would have thought. 
you can switch, you can get different weapons as well, weapons and gear. So I favoured the axe and shield, which I would have thought is what people mostly associate with Vikings, with their, you know, throw it, like hitting people with big axes, right? Yeah, feels Viking enough to me. Yeah. What about Eivor as a person? Does she feel sufficiently Viking? Does she believe in Odin? Yeah, oh yeah. Is she happy to steal a bishop's hat and go to the toilet in it, or whatever it is Vikings yeah, do? Yeah, they, so they shout some terrible things as they're raiding monasteries. You, I should say, you can't actually harm, I mean, you can harm civilians in it, but if you do, the game tells you off, basically. It, it says, like, it, you know, Vikings didn't do that, stop it. It, it says you'll be desynchronized, which is the, the game's way of saying that they will make you reload if you kill too many um, non-violent NPCs. So you can't actually murder any bishops. And also, if you look around the monasteries and stuff, most of the time it turns out that the bishops were like evil anyway, so it's fine. Like they'll, <laughs> they'll have like a diary saying, I love stealing food from poor people or something. Um, but uh, they, as a person, they're, quite, they're very confident, they're very brash, but also will have like words of wisdom for children or maybe someone who's at a crossroads in their life. They'll always have some sort of nice saying to to help them. And they are, so you do have like a little kind of town which you're um, building up and gets bigger as you go. And they are like, there are just, you just can have female warriors in your little crew and nobody, there's no like, nobody comments on like women being involved at all. It's not made thing nobody's stopping you yeah there's no there's no issue with like nobody cares there's no because there was in uh, an earlier assassin's creed game which was a pirate themed one which is assassin's creed black flag one of the pirates was just very obviously a woman in disguise and then that was revealed in a cutscene where it's just like but you're a woman like but but in this just that there are just women running around with big axes and shields and that and and also like you some of the soldiers you fight are women as well they'll just be in the mix there there's no differentiation made at all really that time ravensthorpe is that something that you build as you go along like or does it grow as you complete missions or are you actually lifting like wooden beams and laying foundations and stuff i saw somewhere in between the two so you turn up and there are like tents for like like this tent is where you can put a ship yard or like a shipbuilder's hut and this tent is for the uh the blacksmith so um the reason you have to go raid monasteries it's like a core loop as, as we would say is that you need currency called uh it's literally just a currency called uh raw materials which you can only get from monasteries they just have boxes of raw materials the catholic church always hoarding the raw materials so yeah you have to go and get raw materials from monasteries and abbeys to then use them to build bits of your settlement so if you want to get tattoos and cool asymmetrical haircuts you need to build the tattoo hut I see. Well, it's probably not as useful as like any of the other huts, which can give you like XP and stuff for completing challenges. But I'm pretty sure that it's it's the hut that people will build quite early on because they want to give their over like a cool haircut. How do you feel about the tattoos and the haircuts now that you've learned there isn't all that much historical evidence for for having an asymmetrical haircut? Is it still cool? Or is historical accuracy <laughs> cooler? I mean, well, I had already, I already, I already knew that. Uh, oh, I see. So, oh, I'm sorry. I know. Um, I already knew there was only one source for that because a couple of years ago, I interviewed um, for an article about um, God of War's depiction of the Norse gods. I interviewed a man called Dr. Jackson Crawford. He's an old Norse specialist, so a language, basically, specialist, but, like, you know, it's translated to all the editors and stuff, uh, at the University of Colorado, Boulder. Is this that cowboy Viking? Yeah, the cowboy Viking, who, and he has a YouTube channel, and he actually did translation work for Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Wow. Yeah, and he told me that, yeah, there's only one source for that. But he talked about how, like, the appearance of Vikings in pop culture is basically filtered through, like, what looks cool on screen, right? Like, what is fun for an audience as well. And he mentioned that an interesting thing that happened 
with God of War is that a, a colleague who worked in translation, who has also worked on Assassin's Creed Valhalla doing translation, uh, her name's Maya Backfall, I think. She noticed that in God of War, her translations that she sent were, there, were changed and made less accurate, but it looked like what they were doing was trying to make it so the runes kind of looked like the words themselves, so the player... Could- like English. Well, so the player could sort of transliterate them almost, yeah. Oh, I see, okay. So the player experience goes before the historical accuracy, which you can sort of understand that not many people are going to notice that you've got the runes wrong, and very few people are going to try and learn runes from a video game anyway. We we heard from Kat about what the Vikings got up to when they weren't murdering and pillaging, they were trading and so forth. In in Ravensthorpe, for example, what's the major pastime for all of the other NPC villagers? Do they do they play Nefetafel, that board game? No, you can there is a dice game you can play, but I don't think it is called that. The main thing, pastime thing that you do is uh, and it's pastime is perhaps the wrong word, uh it, but it's flighting is the kind of the recreational thing, which is sort of I mean that like they tried to style it as like yeah it's like the rap battles of the past but it's more like you know in Monkey Island in Curse of Monkey Island where you did the insult battles this like the old adventure game yeah. where you had to have a an insult ready to reply against a, another person who insulted you so instead of having an actual sword fight you would insult someone but your your response had to rhyme it's basically that so someone will quite slowly say an insult to you in in sort of like a b a b rhyming <laughs> and then you have to you have to respond appropriately and so you have like a little timer so i i can't think of a good example well you're not you're not a professional flighter i wouldn't ask that of you i'm not no but it would be like if i was like Brandy, you're rubbish and your feet really smell. And then and then you'd be like... And I'd be like, at least I'm not a minion of the goddess hell. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And then if you do well in that, you can, you can win money, basically. And also, your charisma goes up. Of course. Everyone knows if you win a poetry competition, yeah. your charisma goes up. Sometimes you'll, have, you'll be like breaking someone out of jail or something. There'll be like the little cutscenes where uh, someone will be like, stop, you can't do that. Um, and then you can respond either by being like, screw you, I'll kill you. And then you get in a fight. Or you can, if your charisma is high enough, you can do a sort of charismatic response to kind of persuade them. You can them. just rhyme at them. Well, Just tell them a poem and then they'll be like, oh yeah, no, sure, let them out of prison, no well, problem. Well, y- you'd think that given how you earn charisma points, but every single time I've done it, you've just threatened to kill them and they've run away. <laughs> so, which I don't think is really very persuasive. Well, it's very persuasive, but it's not, you know, eloquent. <laughs> Traditionally, the Assassin's Creed games, they have a lot of big cities, uh, or they ha- they have in the past, and like lots to climb. Mm. But this one looks very green and unspoiled. It's like England before there were any huge towns or cities. Mm. Um, what what do you climb in this one? Well, I mean, there are medium towns and cities. Um, that so there are some places that you know, like York and places like that exist, and Norwich, although it's Northwick, which and London exist as well. Um, so there are some sort of medium-sized buildings that you can climb and jump around, uh, and trees as well. But the tallest bits are are, uh, mostly Roman ruins, which do not exist anymore, sort of thing. Like, at least not in the size they were or are depicted in Assassin's Creed Valhalla. But that's why also you have your wolf steed to ride around on to sort of cover the, the open spaces, and your longboat as well, which you ride up and down on rivers. Oh yeah, how important are these rivers? This network of rivers, Kat was telling us mm. that, that that's the backbone of the Viking economy. So how does Eivor get along on the rivers? It is quite cool that you can go quite fast up and down Yeah, the, the rivers to travel. I mean, like, I can see how it would be very important if Eivor did not have access to fast travel. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I, I bet I used the rivers a lot the first time I went somewhere kind of thing. But it is, but it's got um, that your crew can sing. Uh, and there's also, uh, you have like a little, a mate uh, on your ship called Bragi who can tell stories, um, which is a, a reference to the Norse god Bragi who told stories and stuff as well, I think, I believe. So it's, it's shown that it is culturally significant, I would say, but like, I don't know how much players will actually find themselves using it outside of the times they are forced to, unless they really enjoy it, which I can see they would. Do you ever take the boat and go and sail anywhere else? Do you ever go to Eastern Europe or Russia or Turkey? Uh, there is DLC, there's post-launch content planned, uh, where you'll go elsewhere, uh, including Ireland. Oh yeah, I remember seeing this. Yeah. You go and introduce the snakes to Ireland or something. Yeah, that is, that's the sort of thing. That... Is there any... You didn't notice any cosmetic option in the game that includes a nice bead necklace made of a semi-precious stone sourced in India. No, sadly not, I'm afraid. But they do, I mean, there are, it's slightly spoilery, but you do that. You do have some, it's not really spoilery because they're in it from like the first minute of the game. But um, there are, you, you are technically not an assassin in this. You're just a big Viking. But you are friends with some assassins. Who, who are, they call themselves the hidden ones at this point, and they have come from, I think, I can't remember if they explicitly say, but Jerusalem? I think that's where the order was sort of, I can't remember exactly, but, but they have, basically they, like, they came back with your mate who travelled to, I guess, the, the Middle East, like, you know, Asia, who went on like a big trip and has been gone for a couple of years. So it does reference that the Vikings travelled much further afield than just Europe. That's cool. I, d I can't remember if it says explicitly where they're from, but it's just like, yes, it was very hot there. The Assassin's Creed has really confusing lore, though, because like, the first game is set during the Crusades like in and around Jerusalem. But then it turns out the Assassin's Order was founded in Egypt uh, around the time of Cleopatra. So, yeah. Now, because this is a video game with RPG elements, you can also get romantic with people. So I want you to... Oh, yeah. Tell us what many of the listeners have probably been shouting to hear. Does I Eivor ever end up smooching anyone? How many people can Eivor smooch in the Viking era? There are some, there's quite a bit of smooching. There are a couple of people at your camp that you can sort of smooch. One of the hunters who runs like the hunter hut bit, you can sort of like go on dates with. And the dates are, are like shooting flaming arrows and stuff because she's like a, a rough, tough wilderness girl. And... What else? You can. This is a little bit spoilery, but you, your uh, your brother's wife starts to fancy you, so you can smooch her. I got two experience points for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, there are some people out in the world that you can meet and smooch. So there's quite a few. There's a mix of male and female smooch options, but and they are all open to to you, whether you're male or female, Avel. And it's always kind of like it's a bit it's a bit rough and tumble. It's always every time I've I've smooched someone, it's been outdoors, or in like a ruined stone tower or something. <laughs> it's, it's not very comfortable smooching. It wouldn't be back then. No, that's how they did it all in Roman ruins. I suppose you've got to <laughs> make the best of it, haven't you? <laughs> all right, that's all we have time for. Uh, you've been listening to Hair Lesson. With uh, me, Brendan Caldwell, and my guest co-host this time, Alice Bale. Thank you very much for joining us, Alice. Uh, where can people find you on the internet? Can they find you on the internet? No, they can't. I've basically scrubbed all presents from the internet. <laughs> so... oh, is there anything you want to, sh to offer them as a breadcrumb trail? Uh, you can find more opinions of mine about Assassin's Creed and many other things, including vampire-themed bath bombs, and what other stuff have I written about? Indie games as well, I write about them on uh, www.rockpapershotgun.com, the best PC gaming website ever in the whole world. Never heard of it. Do you have to do like a disclosure? <laughs> um, I think if, if people have listened to other episodes, they'll know that I did used to work with you and others on Rock Paper Shotgun and they they probably know this considering that maybe 50% of the guest co-hosts I've had on <laughs> are from Rock Paper Shotgun 
Uh, and I'm, I I was saying to, because I had even Matt Cox, yeah. uh, who was once a writer there as well, is on our bonus podcast that patrons get for $5 a month. I was telling him, yeah, I'm cannibalizing the entire yeah. Rock, Paper, Shotgun staff, both former and current. You're doing uh, great work for us, though, just because uh, like, you know, every week you have to say Rock, Paper, Shotgun again. So. <laughs> <laughs> It's yeah, it works out. It's a good deal. It's a good deal for me. Uh, have you noticed, Alice? There's no ads or sponsors on the podcast. Do you know what I have? And uh, I, I really appreciate. How do you manage that? Actually, well, what it is, I do right is mm. if the listener likes the podcast, they can support the show by becoming a regular donor, and they get extra goodies, including access to the full interviews with scientists, doctors, experts, all of the the experts that we had. Like I've said, and in those interviews, they mentioned much more. They talk about far more interesting stuff, like um, uh, I don't know. <laughs> other other tiers of support uh, will also get you bonus episodes, behind the scenes videos, all loads of stuff, and uh, they get that just by going to Patreon.com/slash Hey Lesson or following the links in the in the show notes. That's how that's how we get no ads. Do you know how poor it makes us to make, to have no ads? It's incredible. So it's good that we have these these patrons. Yeah, yeah, and you explain it so eloquently there. I think it sounds like a really good investment. It's a good deal. Anyway, that's all we have time for. Thank you, listener. Please give us a review on iTunes if you've got a moment. That helps us too. Uh, I'm also on Twitch every Thursday evening to talk about the latest episodes or to play a game related to the topics of our show. So if you're on Twitch, uh, check that out at twitch.tv slash heylesson. Until next time, thank you again, Alice. Thank you for having me, Brendy. How do the Vikings say goodbye in Assassin's Creed Valhalla? Uh, I don't. They, they just kind of, you know, those like cool handshakes where you grasp someone else's forearm. <laughs> we can't do that in a completely auditory medium. No. <laughs> um, skull. 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 <laughs> <laughs>